Today we're going to talk about the development of agriculture in the Americas and the American Indian societies as they existed in 1492 when Europeans showed up. So last time we talked about the first arrival of human beings in the Americas. As we mentioned, the ancestors of American Indians by 32,000 uh, BC had expanded into this Beringia. Uh, the end of the Ice Age uh, got these polar ice caps melting, cut off you know, maybe even just a couple hundred individuals in uh, what would today be Alaska. At the same time, you see the melting of these glaciers in Canada and along the coast. And we're going to see humans moving into North America for the first time. Again, you have these megafauna animals that have never been exposed to humans, don't understand that they can use tools, do things that other animals can't. This is going to allow these humans to drive these uh, megafauna to extinction. Again, going to be great for the first humans because, you know, cheap meat, easy to hunt. But for later generations, they're not going to have access to these domesticatable animals. They drive a lot of the domesticatable animals in the Americas to extinction. And, um, <clears throat> and, and we're going to have to now move to find new sources of game. Initially, these humans are going to expand into other areas of North America, eventually South America, but they're going to hunt the megafauna to extinction in those regions as well. <clears throat> By uh, 10,000 BC or so, most of the megafauna has gone extinct. Humans have already reached the bottom of South America. Now we're going to have humans, uh, uh, these first humans in the Americas. What do we do now? Well, you'll see them start turning to hunt smaller game, developing things like the atlatl bow and arrow to hunt the smaller animals. Well, right around the time that the megafauna go, are going to go extinct and right around the time that people in certain areas are developing these weapons, we're going to see two groups in what's today uh, Mexico and the Andes, around what would be Peru, Ecuador, uh, northern Chile, uh, Bolivia, so Mesoamerica, uh, Central America, Mexico today, the Andes, two groups here and we think this happens independently we think that people just happen to figure this out by themselves one group over here one group over here uh, are going to figure out how to grow food right now what i'm going to describe is incredibly simplistic it's a lot more complicated than i'm going to portray it again you know i'm going to try to have to do this this simplified version so what we think happens Somewhere in Mesoamerica, somewhere in the Andes, a group is walking around. Now, at this point, 10,000 B.C. or so, um, 8,000 B.C., again, there's some number d differentiation between anthropologists. But we, we're going to see people figure out, hey, we can actually get more calories from growing plants than we can moving around constantly hunting. And this is going to be a big deal because growing food, agriculture, supplies a lot more calories than hunting and gathering does. So the way we think this happens is very questionable. But what more or less may have happened is a group of Indians, again at this point 10,000 years ago, everybody in the Americas is hunter-gatherers. Um, this means they're just walking around in groups of a dozen, two dozen, maybe three dozen, constantly on the move searching for small game. If you're a hunter-gatherer, you don't have time to do anything other than hunt, gather, sleep. You're constantly on the move. You don't have mental energy to do very much. You don't have physical energy to do very much. You're constantly searching for food. Today, if you go to you know apes, it's basically the same thing. They're constantly moving around. All hours of their day are spent sleeping or eating. Well, humans were the same way in the Americas until about 10,000 years ago. And somebody in Mesoamerica, somebody in the Andes, don't have any idea who, makes an observation. So let's say they, a group walks by a set of bushes they'd been to uh, a year before. So every year they're on this migration looking around for this game. And every year they stop at this, these bushes and maybe they pick these naturally growing berries, supplementing their hunting diet with the berries. Well, somebody eats the berries, then maybe they stay there two days out of the year eating the berries, then move on to go hunt the game. Well, somebody's going to notice when they come back to get these berries. Again, don't know if it's berries, don't know if it's a grain, don't know what it is. But somebody among these groups, one person in the Andes, one person in Mesoamerica, is going to make the observation, hey, remember when we were here last year, when we ate these berries, we went to the bathroom over there, 
well, I'll be damned if the, there's not berry bushes growing where we pooped. And somebody's going to maybe say, well, do you think it's these little brown seed things, let's call them seeds, that are in the berries? Well, heck, I don't know. Let's experiment. And then they eat the berries. Maybe they stay there an extra day this year. So they're moving 365 days a year. Maybe they stay there two days. Now they stay an extra three days, just digging a little bit of dirt, throwing these berries down. Well, the next year they're going to come around, and they're going to notice, hey, remember when we planted these berries? There are new berry bushes growing. Well, what if we stay an extra day and we grow um, a couple, uh, throw a couple more seeds in the ground? And maybe this doesn't happen the next year. Maybe this is three generations down the road. Maybe one group does it, they throw some seeds in the ground, and then their grandkids or something, or maybe it's not even their grandkids. Maybe it's a neighboring tribe sees what they're doing. They start planting these berry seeds. And maybe they spend a little extra time planting a couple more seeds. So now they're staying there five days uh, out of the year. Well, maybe they go around and they notice, you know, a um, couple generations down the road, maybe, hey, um, I noticed that we're losing a lot of these bushes. Some of the ones that we only dig up maybe an inch or two of dirt, rats are eating them or some sort of animals digging up the seeds and eating them. What if we stay an extra couple days, we dig deeper in the dirt and we, we plant the seeds deeper so more of them will survive. Now they're staying here a week. Again, oversimplified version. So now they're going around hunting, gathering for, you know, 350 days a year, but they're spending two weeks to, to bury these seeds. And they're getting a lot of calories in return because it's not as much work um, as hunting and gathering, at least not initially. And they're getting a lot of calories uh, in return from these berry bushes. Well, maybe next generation, maybe it's that same generation, somebody makes uh, the observation hey, you notice that um, these berries, if, if they have these eggs on them, the bugs eat the berries. So maybe we should stay here a couple extra days and maybe we should pick the, the eggs off so nobody, uh, so the bugs won't eat them. So we'll have even more berries. Now they're staying there uh, five weeks or something. And so they're still primarily hunter-gatherers, but they're starting to adopt agriculture. And then maybe, you know, the next year comes around, they notice all right, we're not getting as many berry bushes because it didn't rain. What if we dig a little channel from the creek over here and we flood the fields before uh, we leave? So now they're staying here a little bit extra time to dig these channels to, to flood the fields. Now they're there a month. What begins to happen in these two areas, and we don't think they learned it from each other, and by the way, this is also going to be happening in China, uh, in, in the Middle East, and possibly other areas, is this agricultural revolution. Basically, people are going to start making this transition from hunter-gatherers to agriculturalists without even knowing it. They're going to slowly start stopping in uh, one place more and more time out of the year to cultivate crops, and they're going to start setting aside the hunting and gathering. That's going to become less important to them. And I don't want you to think this is just one tribe doing it. This isn't one guy comes up with the idea, his grandson then is the one that comes up with the next idea. Maybe this one hunter-gatherer group, they start spending time here, their neighbors start noticing it, they start doing it with their own berry bushes. This group over there starts noticing it, maybe they start doing it with a fruit tree that they, they particularly like. And we start seeing these sort of hubs for agriculture develop. And before you know it, what happens in these two areas of the Americas, and it's really happened by 3000 BC, actually uh, even uh, well before that, uh, but it, it starts happening uh, 10,000 years ago, maybe 8000 BC, again, a lot of different numbers we get here, is we see this transition to agriculture and people without knowing it, oh, and again, this is over the course of generations and generations, start to become sedentary. They stop moving from one place to another, and now they're in one location. And again, this isn't just one group. It's going to be a bunch of different groups growing through this process together. One group starts it. Everybody, you know, neighbors learn from them. They maybe invent something. The original group learns something from them. But what you start to see in Mesoamerica and the Andes is your first sedentary civilizations and your first agriculture-based civilizations in the Americas. And this is going to be pretty important because when you turn to agriculture, you're not going to be, uh, you're, you're not 
you're going to get a lot more calories than you would of hunting and gathering, okay? Hunting and gathering, you're constantly on the move. You're expending energy, you know, uh, you're, you're hunting a lot of different animals. You're getting a lot of different plant sources, but you're constantly on the move. You're constantly searching for food. If you're doing agriculture, and my numbers are going to be a little off here, but I'm going to uh, uh, play with them just for, for the sake of the argument here. You can basically have, say, three people providing the food for 10 people or whatever. You don't need everybody searching for food to get the calories for everybody. In hunter-gatherer societies, you do. In hunter-gatherer societies, you have maybe two dozen people. Every single one of them is contributing to searching for food, shelter, that type of thing. They're, they're all contributing. You don't need that in an agricultural society. These three people can tend to the berry bush. Maybe, at, you know, again, after a couple thousand years, it's not just berries, but other things. We'll talk about this, like corn, potatoes, tomatoes, things like that. These people are cultivating these crops. This guy isn't needed anymore. He doesn't need to be there in the food production because uh, these guys are taking care of him. This person here, too, we don't need you around because these three are, are providing our calories. This person doesn't need because these people are providing their calories. So now you're going to see for the first time in human history in the Americas, surplus labor. You have people that don't need to be involved in the food production process. Today in the United States, what do we have? 2% of people are involved directly in farming. So we have 2% uh, of people are growing food, uh, ranching, something like that. That opens up 98% of other people to be doing other things. Teaching, playing video games, streaming, all these different type of things. You can't do that unless you have somebody providing the food. And we now have that in the Americas, okay? So this opens up labor. Now, it's not going to be early agriculture. Initially, it's going to be 80% of the people have to provide the calories, but you're, you're going to have maybe 20% that are out open for this labor. But for our purposes, we're just going to say it's a smaller percentage. So now this person, we're not a hunter-gatherer society anymore. These people are providing extra calories. This is going to mean the population is going to grow as well because if you have surplus calories, it's not like a hunter-gatherer society where you, know, you just have enough calories to maybe have a couple people survive. Now you're going to have more children survive into adulthood. You can produce more breast milk, that type of thing. So you're going to see populations grow beyond just a couple dozen people. Hunter-gatherer society is just a couple dozen people. Now you're going to start seeing Mesoamerica, the Andes, your first towns, and they're going to have surplus labor. And this surplus labor is going to allow the towns to grow even more. So what are you going to do with this surplus labor? We now have agricultural societies, again, by six, 7,000 B.C., fully agricultural societies. We now have surplus labor. What can these people do? Well, what you're going to see is there, there's going to be people starting to innovate. Okay, You can't innovate if you're hunter-gatherer because you're searching for calories constantly. So this person now doesn't have to uh, provide the food because these people are providing the food. Maybe this person can start to experiment with the crops, do things like selective breeding. What you're going to have in Mesoamerica and the Andes is beginnings of crops that are sort of cultivated for human beings. In, in the Andes, you have a, a native or a, a natural potato plant that you can get some calories from, but it's not like the potatoes we have today. Well, what some early agricultural societies begin to do in the Andes is they'll start taking the bigger potatoes, planting those, all right? So we're not going to uh, plant the small potatoes because we can only get a couple calories from those. We'll plant the big potatoes. Same thing here in Mesoamerica. What happens here in Mesoamerica is you get some surplus people. They'll start taking, you know, big berries and only planting the seeds from those. Uh, you know, we'll just throw away the, the, the um, small ones or the berries that seem to be resistant to the bugs. We'll, we'll selectively breed those seeds. And actually what you're going to have in Mesoamerica is people start uh, experimenting with this grass called uh, teosinte. So teosinte is a uh, grass that's native to Mesoamerica that only provides a couple calories. So uh, if you guys eat corn, we all know that you eat corn, you see it once, going in, you see it uh, going out, there's a husk around the corn. Well, this is because corn is actually a grass in its native form. It looks like this. Now, corn, before it becomes corn that we know it today, this teosinte, 
Each of these kernels has a tiny bit of calories, but it's mostly husk. Well, what humans in Mesoamerica as they're developing agriculture will start to do is they'll start to take the teosinte with the thinner husks, but with the bigger, more uh, uh, calorie-dense kernels, they'll start selectively breeding those. And over a couple hundred years, it starts to look a little bit more like corn today. And then until we get um, uh, in, in uh, closer to modern times, uh, we get this corn looking like we have it today. As a matter of fact, corn is so different from its native state, has gone through thousands of years of selective breeding by the people of Mesoamerica, that corn wouldn't survive without humans. It's invented by people because uh, uh, it can be because we now have this agricultural society. You have people that can actually start to selectively breed plants. And this is just, you know, a couple of these people uh, uh, starting this selective breeding process. You're also going to see some of these people with their extra labor. Maybe we can start domesticating more animals. You'll actually see in Mesoamerica and the Andes, certain animals start to be bred for consumption by humans. In Mesoamerica, they start taking turkeys, selectively breeding those, uh, so the only the ones that are, you know, don't freak out around humans uh, uh, are, are chosen and, and uh, the ones that are going to have kids. In the Andes, you start seeing animals like llamas, alpacas, things that can carry stuff for people. They'll start to be br uh, bred for their, you know, the ones that are docile, uh, guinea pigs, that type of thing. So if you ha you can't do that if you're a hunter-gatherer. You can, again, maybe domesticate dogs because naturally them and humans are, are kind of uh, uh, fit together evolution-wise. But you can't, to to selectively breed other animals, you got to have surplus labor. And we start seeing that in these agricultural societies. So we start seeing better crops being produced. We start seeing animals selectively bred. And what this is going to mean is that now we have even more labor. So if you have, instead of just growing this grass or these berries, you're now getting big berries, you're now getting corn, that's even more calories. So maybe that's going to even open up an additional laborer. Again, I'm just playing with the numbers here and I'm trying to uh, simplify an overcomplicated process. But now we're going to have even more calories. So let's say we now have an additional person opened up. Uh, what are we going to do with this person? Okay. So we're cultivating crops, we're starting to see population centers. Maybe this person can become an inventor, all right? You can't invent if you're a hunter-gatherer. You don't have, everybody's constantly searching for food, you don't have the mental energy to do anything like that. Maybe this person is going to be, hey, you know what I, I notice is that the ground's really tough. Um, you know, it takes a long time to hoe the ground. What if I invent a tool that will cut open the ground, make it really easy to drag this across, and then we can plant seeds much more efficiently, less labor used. And so maybe you get somebody inventing something like that. Or maybe somebody inventing a pot or something like that, pottery, advanced pottery, that you can put corn kernels in. So in times of drought, you know, if uh, if the, the rain doesn't come that year, the crop doesn't grow, you'll be fine because you've got these pots full of corn uh, because, you know, now you have the these, this invention or you learned it from the neighbor that somebody then in, invented it. And so now your population is going to uh, start surviving. Maybe you can have somebody, uh, if you're near the coast or something, somebody that can put the brain power into creating a boat that's much, much better, uh, much more efficient at fishing, something like that. Uh, maybe you'll have people, and we'll actually see this in the Amazon, people come up with better ways to uh, grow crops by mixing ash with the soil or pottery, broken pottery with the soil. Then you can grow more co crops per square acre. So we can have inventors now that we have uh, surplus labor. You're also going to see uh, with this agriculture and this push towards agriculture, these societies start growing, more population, more people to... Uh, uh, be invested in other things in food production, things that you can't have as hunter-gatherers like religion or complex religion. Now, hunter-gatherer societies, you know, you'll have a religion that, you know, some chief makes up, maybe a couple aspects get passed down for generation, uh, from one generation to the next, but you don't have the complicated things because you don't have anybody devoted to religion. Well, when you start getting these complex societies, maybe this guy becomes a, a shaman and he's going to start explaining things much more complicated way than a hunter-gatherer would come up with. Uh, so maybe the corn is uh, developed by the corn mother, maybe the son is the son father, something like that. 
And it's almost like a scientist. Shaman's almost like a scientist and then trying to explain the natural world through supernatural f phenomena. Um, you can't really have this complex religion unless you have surplus labor. It's just you don't have the mental energy to do it. Same thing, art. If you get these societies surplus calories, artists couldn't do what they're doing unless somebody else is making their food for them. Sorry, artists. But you're, you know, as a historian, I could say this, we're, we're not very important on the food chain, you know, we're not, we're sort of, it, it's a luxury that we're able to do what we were able to do. But if you have the surplus labor, now you can start creating, you know, beautiful pottery, you can start creating sculptures, you can't devote the energy to char carving out a, a, a beautiful rock carving unless you have surplus labor, you can't build monument, monumental architecture um, stone buildings unless you start um, unless you have this surplus labor sports you start seeing sports being played Mesoamerican the Andes and you're gonna see it spread to the rest of America yeah, America's you don't have the mental energy the physical energy to do that as a hunter-gatherer society um, maybe wrestle or something maybe you you fight the neighboring tribe or something and in, in a, a foot race or something but you're gonna start seeing complex sports come out of this so what we see in Mesoamerican the Andes, stuff like uh, um, this Mesoamerican ball game. This is actually lacrosse, another sport that's going to come out of the Americas after we get agriculture. Uh, you also start to see monumental architecture. This is uh, Machu Picchu. It, it was built in the Andes. Um, it used to look different than this, obviously. This is the ruins of it. A hunter-gatherer society would not be able to build a single one of these stone buildings. Doesn't have the labor to do that, you know, to carry the rocks up. So uh, it's going to take a, one of these Andes civilizations um, getting a surplus uh, agriculture, enough laborers to do this. Uh, you, again, you can't have that in a hunter-gatherer society. So this is going to be a major change. Uh, you see right here, shelter, complex buildings, even just this simple shelter, a hunter-gatherer society would have a hard time building it. But think what that's going to do for your population. You can now have more people survive if you're not as exposed to the elements. Uh, clothing is going to become more complex if you have somebody that can now weave. All right. All right. So agriculture is going to have a huge impact in, in that regard. There's also going to be other changes that, you know, you can kind of see as negatives. All right. In hunter-gatherer society, if you're searching from one place to another for food, there's no social stratification. Everybody contributes. Maybe you have a chief everybody listens to, but everybody's pushing towards the same goal. You don't have guy at the bottom, uh, you know, who's lower status than the guy at the top. Hunter-gatherer society is actually very democratic. Everybody contributes. Um, everybody's pretty much on equal ground because you need to be on equal ground to survive. When you start getting agriculture and you start getting populations in the hundreds and in the thousands, which we're going to start seeing cities um, in the Andes and Mesoamerica in the hundreds, thousands, eventually tens of thousands, you'll have um, now people that need uh, to do certain work. And then you're going to have people up at the top that need to start giving orders. So if you have this population, you know that couple people need to do the farm work, somebody needs to do the inventing, somebody needs to do the art, somebody needs to do whatever, you're going to have to make sure these people do the work. So how are we going to do that? Doing this type of work, agriculture stinks. We'll talk about this more in a second, but it isn't fun. Maybe this guy says, I don't want to do this. I want to be an artist. Well, you got to get this guy to work. How are you going to do it? Well, what you need to do is you need to establish rules you need to establish sort of a hierarchy. You need to establish class. And so you're going to start seeing people wanting to uh, say that they rule others. You're going to start needing government. You don't need government in hunter-gatherer societies. Again, they're very democratic. You need somebody to give out orders in order to sort of keep things stable, especially when you get this uh, larger society. So what you're going to start to see in some of these cities is essentially monarchies. Uh, people, I'm the boss. You do this work, you do that work. Um, a lot of times this, you know, uh, passes down to their son or daughter. Uh, you do this work, you do this work. And when this happens, you're going to see the people at the top start justifying the reason they're at the top by saying, I'm born to this, I deserve this. You at the bottom, you're a laborer because that's your station in life. 
Again, you don't see that hunter-gatherer societies, but we're going to start seeing this class stratification uh, in beginnings of government uh, in these agricultural societies, which again, you do not see in uh, hunter-gatherer societies. Another thing, so now we've got, again, our, our laborers, we've got our inventor, we've got um, our builder, maybe, we've got our artist, um, maybe this guy's the chief, or he would have been, the, uh, you know, he's not farming anymore, he'd be the chief. Uh, now that this guy doesn't have to work, what can we do with him? You'll see a lot of these uh, societies, these agricultural societies, start creating military, all right? So let's say you are an early agricultural society. Maybe you've been growing food for a couple generations. Your uh, local area population's increased to 100,000, or not 100,000, but 1,000. A, a um, you got some surplus people. Why not train them to kill other people? In hunter-gatherer societies, people constantly searching for food. They get in fights all the time, but they are trained, most of their lives spent hunting, so they know how to kill deer. They don't know how to kill other people. This guy, if you got people growing food for him, he can spend all hours of the day learning how to best throw a spear at somebody, learning how to evade somebody's arrow attack, something like that. And let's say you get enough of these guys, your civilization's doing fine. Um, well, maybe you're starting to low, run low on food. We'll send these guys over to the next town. You know, they're developing agriculture as well. They're really, they're really far along also. Send them over there and tell them, hey, listen to us or give us food or we're going to kill you. Now you have a ruler of your town. He's now not only telling your town what to do, he's telling the neighboring town what to do. And basically you have the beginnings of an empire and you're able to do this because certain places invest in the military and they're going to take over other places. Now maybe you, you tell this neighboring town, send us some of your people to turn as soldiers. Then you got this, uh, these soldiers coming over here, your military is even bigger. Now you send them to this third town and you tell the third town, send us soldiers. Now you've got you know, three towns under you, then even more soldiers. Eventually, you get, you know, uh, a empires forming. And as a matter of fact, we're going to see empires in the millions form in Mesoamerica and the Andes by 1492, a couple different ones. Uh, and ones we'll talk about, the Incan Empire eventually gets to 10 million people. Uh, Aztec Empire, we'll talk about that one later. 10 million people as well. And that's because agriculture allows people to get military and then you can start subduing other people. You don't have that in hunter-gatherer societies. Again, hunter-gatherer societies, they wouldn't have the energy for a prolonged fight They don't have uh, because they don't have this agriculture. So it sounds like this is good in some ways. It's sort of bad in some ways. I should say it's going to be good for the person up at the top because you will now have people that don't do nearly as much. Their life isn't constantly searching for food. People down here at the bottom, things aren't that great. Um, you know, humans aren't designed to bend over, plow the fields all day. Uh, and so people at the bottom are going to start suffering from things the human body's just not used to. Osteoporosis, uh, the backs will start getting uh, bent out of shape. It's not just that, but once you start getting into this agriculture, humans just start relying on uh, a couple of different staple crops. Like in Mesoamerica, it's going to be corn, being squash in the Andes, you'll have potatoes, uh, a little bit of manioc, a little bit of um, uh, tomatoes, that type of thing. But it's only going to be a handful of crops. This is going to be a problem because a handful of crops aren't going to provide all the nutrients you need. So you'll start to actually see, even though these guys are calorie rich, they're not going to be getting certain nutrients they probably uh, would be getting as hunter-gatherers that are moving from one place to another. As a matter of fact, this is kind of the interesting uh, factor. Agriculture uh, societies produce a surplus of calories, uh, and they can survive times of drought. So uh, if there's a drought where, um, you know, uh, for, for a summer, if you're a hunter-gatherer, that's going to be a problem because the animals are going to die you don't get this food, you're probably going to die. Agricultural societies are fine for a couple uh, years of drought because in surplus years, they just bury the excess grain or they store the excess grain for, for times that uh, of drought. Um, so they can survive. But the problem is, again, that you're just relying on a couple crops. So in times where there's plenty of rain, hunter-gatherers are actually getting more sources of nutrition 
a, a different diet, much different diet than, than agricultural societies. Uh, there was recently a study, I shouldn't say recently, I think it was the 1970s, where scientists followed hunter-gatherer group in Africa. They found that they ate something like 70, uh, 70 73 sources of food. So they would uh, go around, they would eat grubs, they would eat certain animals, certain berries. And so they're fine in, in times of, of uh, uh, when there's, it's not a drought. Um, and they actually get a lot more nutrition. But if you go to early agricultural societies, now today we're fine because we have avocados, we import stuff from everywhere, but these early agricultural societies, you're just getting it from a couple different food sources and your nutritional needs aren't, aren't going to be met in a lot of cases. So in times of drought, it's you'd prefer to be an agricultural society, but in, in some ways, you know, the, the hunter-gatherer society is better. They're actually better when it comes to um, the quality of their teeth. Uh, one of the ways that archaeologists can tell when a society gets agriculture is when teeth start to decay. So once you start to rely more on crops and you get most of your diet from crops, um, you're going to start getting carbohydrates. So corn's got a lot of sugar in it. Um, uh, potatoes have got sugar in it. So in hunter-gatherer societies, there's not as much tooth decay because they're eating animals. They are eating plants, but not these, uh, these carbohydrate-dense plants that the agriculturalists are eating. But when these guys are going to have just horrible tooth decay. Dentists wouldn't be a thing, by the way, if um, if we weren't agricultural. If we were still living as hunter-gatherers, wouldn't need them because our tooth wouldn't decay as, as much. So that's sort of a modern profession. So that's sort of another negative here. You have toothache. You have tooth loss. You have, um, again, these classes that will start to form. Uh, one other thing about these hunter-gatherer or agricultural societies in general, they're not going to have as much protein. At least in the Americas, they're not going to have as much protein as hunter-gatherer societies. So hunter-gatherer societies constantly move around hunting the, these animals. Agricultural societies, you get beans, but you don't get as complex of proteins as hunter-gatherers. And as a matter of fact, agricultural societies in the Americas, they will uh, domesticate some animals, like again, the turkey in Mesoamerica, uh, the llama, alpaca, alpaca guinea pig in, in the Andes. And they're going to supplement those diet through those sources. But as we talked about 10,000 years ago, they basically uh, driven to extinction some domesticatable animals like the um, uh, their America's version of the ox and the cow. So they're not going to have the large animals to live alongside them like Europeans, Asians, Africans will. They're going to supplement their diet. So agricultural societies in the Americas are still going to have to go out occasionally send people out to hunt and you'll always see you know the, these little patches of land outside of you know where they're growing crops because they need to maintain this place for deer stuff like that because it, there's going to be this protein deficiency so it's not like you get out of all your nutritional needs by becoming hunting and gathering another sort of negative that's going to come out of these agricultural societies is environmental destruction so when you start getting the population growth you get with agricultural societies again more children surviving into adulthood um and you're let's say you start out you know a couple hundred people keep going to a couple thousand people eventually you're not going to have enough fertile land to support your population maybe you send out the military you take the guy uh, over ne the next region eventually there's going to be a stopping point you can't grow any further and again you're going to start using resources like trees you're going to get these sort of environmental bottlenecks where what do I do now? You know, like I, I don't, I can't physically grow more food, but now I have a population. My town has 10,000 people. You'll see population collapses or you'll see environmental destruction to clear out even more land. And as a matter of fact, uh, we're going to have huge swaths of uh, land destroyed in these areas uh, in order to grow farm, you know, so people, one of the things that I really hate, one of the misconceptions I get, uh, we get about American Indians is one with the environment, live with nature. Again, that doesn't even go for hunter gatherers, but especially doesn't go for these agricultural societies. These are human beings. They're going to do what we do today. If they need to burn down this forest to feed their kids, of course, of course, they're going to burn down the, the forest because um, uh, you don't want your kids to starve. So you're actually going to see huge environmental destruction uh, in these agricultural areas. And as a matter of fact, you go to, um, you know, areas of the Yucatan, uh, eventually when agriculture gets up to, makes its way up to North America, you'll, um, uh, you know, see huge swaths of eastern part of North America 
uh, where uh, uh, fields have been burned to, to uh, make land for agriculture. So environmental destruction is going to come along with this. So beginning with these two places, Mesoamerica and the Andes, we're going to have the beginnings of agriculture, and agriculture is going to start expanding. All right, so uh, even though agriculture is going to spread out from Mesoamerica and the Andes, and we're going to see it go almost throughout North America and South America, because it starts in these two areas, this is where we're going to see the most complex uh, civilizations emerge. So uh, kind of the same thing in, in the old world. We'll talk about this later. Uh, Middle East and then China, you see these, these uh, where agriculture starts. This is going to be where some of the most complex civilizations emerge. Same thing happens here in uh, the old world. First people to develop agriculture, this is where a lot of the technologies are going to be developed. This is where a lot of the empires are going to be formed. And this is where a lot of the complex technologies are going to come from. This is where you're going to see the empires start rising and falling. And we're going to see a lot of technologies you wouldn't associate with American Indians being developed in these two areas. Uh, Andes, again, uh, we see uh, multiple civilizations and, and over millions of people as uh, people form these empires. Uh, you, you'll see in some uh, Andes cities what are essentially castles. This is uh, what remains of a, a castle before Europeans arrived. This used to be multiple stories. Um, you'd have a number of different structures like this. Eventually, Europeans are going to come along, start removing the blocks to create Catholic churches, things like that. But this used to be this huge structure, and this is built, again, because Andes, agriculture, excess labor. You can use the people to carve out these huge blocks that you need to create these walls. So we don't think of castles when we think of uh, American Indians, but this is absolutely the case in the Andes. Other things in the Andes, uh, we, we mentioned this. This is going to be a, a Machu Picchu. This is a city. Uh, in the Andes. We don't have a lot of examples of cities uh, in the Andes because uh, either nature has reclaimed them or Europeans have taken them apart. This is one of the few that we have. Um, in the Andes, we actually see the development of something called a quipu or quipi. It's this knotted cord system. So I mentioned we don't have a lot of written records before 1492. The quipu might be writing. It depends on how you interpret it. And again, we don't know exactly how it works um, because as, we're, as we'll talk about in a second, Europeans are going to come along and destroy them. But what we think happened is that as these Andes empires start rising, you have one city start dominating multiple cities. You would have the main city go to the neighboring cities and ask for food, ask for laborers, things like that. Well, to keep track of that, the main city would send out these um, record keepers. Think about them as tax collectors. And what we think they would do is tie these knots in the, in these cords. And what we think these are going to indicate is, hey, um, city over here, Steveville, Steveville, you need to send us eight bushels of corn. You need to send us five laborers. And so this guy is going to go along. He's going to feel the knots. And this is going to describe what you know taxes need to be collected. So we think that's what these quipus or quipis uh, are there for. So this is going to be uh, something we're going to see come out of um, uh, the Andes, this almost writing system. And again, this is something we don't know for sure if we should classify it as writing because when uh, the Spanish come over, they kind of think this is heresy. They're going to collect a lot of these and burn them. There are a couple that uh, still exist. I think we have a couple hundred still in existence. Uh, but everybody who knew how to read them uh, is dead by now. Um, so we only sort of have hints how to read them. Um, actually, Dallas Museum of Art near me has got a couple of these on display. So writing system. Again, that's something you think about with American Indians. Um, in the Andes, you actually have, you can't call it a telephone, but as you start seeing these empires emerge in the Andes, you need to communicate um, between one area and another. Uh, what would be a lot of problem is, let's say this city over here doesn't want to pay the main city anymore. Well, you got to send the soldiers out there. They're having a rebellion. So you would have, you know, guards stationed near the towns, and they would have these knotted cords. They would maybe call up to the next guard station using these phones like, hey, Steve, the, the people down here don't want to give us food and, and laborers anymore. All right, we'll send the army. And then you send it down. Steve goes and tells the main city. The army puts this down. And as a matter of fact, in the uh, Andes, 
uh, because it's rough terrain, it's mountains, you see these complex road systems, thousands of miles of roads, because these main cities of, of these empires would want to put put down these rebellions. Roads, that's not something we, uh, these stone roads, not something we think about when we think about American Indians, uh, essentially telephones. Um, in the Andes, or at the edge of the Andes near the ocean, you see um, seafaring ships. When Europeans first arrived, they would talk about ships where there's 20, 30 people on board. Um, and some of these ships would sail out into the ocean, places like the Galapagos Islands. When the Spanish first show up in the early 1500s off the western coast of South America, they would see these vessels that they said could carry 20 tons, 30 tons, something like that, going out into the ocean uh, to fish, to trade, uh, things like that. As a matter of fact, um, some of these vessels were about the same size as the vessels the Europeans were were sailing in. Again, not something we think about when we think about American Indians. Uh, people of the Andes um, developed bronze working. Now this isn't a technology that's going to be passed uh, outside of the Andes as, as a lot of this other stuff will be, um, but creating bronze is complicated. It's something that requires high pressure. It's not like gold and silver. We're going to talk about gold and silver working. Anybody can work gold and silver. They're very soft metal. So even people that are hunter-gatherers essentially you can pick up a rock and smash a piece of gold to make it a shape you want. That's not complicated. Creating bronze, you got to mix a couple different metals together and you got to put them under high pressure to get the metals to stick together. Even more complicated to create iron. They're not going to, the people in the Americas aren't going to create iron, but they get to the Bronze Age. So they're, at least in the Andes, they're past the Stone Age. So when Europeans are going to show up, they see some bronze weapons. Uh, it's not like they're all stone weapons. Again, not something we think about when we think about American Indians. So this is down here in the Andes where those that type of thing is going to be developed. Some of the stuff developed in the Andes will make its way to Mesoamerica, but it's kind of interesting because we're not going to actually see a lot of technology being shared between Mesoamerica and the Andes. It's almost like they emerge by themselves. A lot of people think it's because this particular area, the geography is so difficult that um, you'll get a handful of crops passing this direction, a handful of crops passing that direction, but a lot of technologies developed in Mesoamerica won't be developed in the Andes. Uh, like for example, these uh, stone buildings that are built in the Andes, they don't have cement or, or anything uh, uh, locking them together. They carve the stone so they fit together. Um, you don't see that in the in uh, Mesoamerica because they actually develop uh, concrete or not necessarily concrete, but a, a form of sticking uh, uh, the stuff uh, stones together. So they don't need to fit the stones together because they have a sealing agent. So we have uh, technologies b being developed in the Andes. We're also going to see technologies being developed in uh, Mesoamerica, and we're going to see the same thing. Agricultural region. This is we're going to see the large civilizations rise and fall. Uh, one of the biggest civilizations that's going to come out of Mesoamerica emerges uh, right around 200 A.D., and you can say a little bit earlier than that, uh, but that's the Mayans. Um, they'll actually have collapsed, for the most part, their civilization before Europeans arrive, but these Mayans at one point are going to be ruling over 10,000 people or so here in uh, this area that's today, the Yucatan, uh, southern Mexico, uh, Central America area. Um, What's going to happen is they're going to be a single ruler, start creating this large army, start putting uh, these different people under his control, and they'll start building these huge monumental cities, these huge stoneworks. If you've ever gone to Cancun or if you ever go to Cancun, make sure to take a trip out into uh, the countryside a little bit. You're going to see these huge pyramids. These are some of the smaller pyramids here, um, but... You'll see these huge cities. Matter of fact, I went to um, Chichen Itza. That's the big one. They've gone through. They've uncovered everything there. Um, but there's even bigger pyramids in, in other areas. Some some of these pyramids haven't been uh, uncovered. As a matter of fact, I was in Belize a different time. Went on top of a pyramid, and I'm up there with a guy from the area. And I look out in the distance, and it's flat. But I see this hill in the distance. I'm like, man, that's kind of weird. This is a flat area, but there's a hill out of nowhere. He's like, no, that's just a pyramid we, we haven't uncovered. They're going to get to the point where they build so many cities and they have uh, so many people under the population that we, in modern times, don't have the technology and the time 
to uncover everything that they dig up. Driving in a taxi cab in Belize, passing by a highway, a uh, taxi driver points out a hill just sitting there by the side of the road, like 15 feet away off the uh, the highway. Oh, that's a, that's a mine pyramid we haven't uncovered. They're everywhere. So you see this because, again, agriculture allows you to do this. Um, Mayans, they're going to be the one Indian civilization that develops a definitive writing system. So um, Europeans, uh, Asians, they're going to develop their own, uh, Africans are going to develop their own writing systems. And writing's different because uh, than pictographs because if you know how to read it, you can read exactly what somebody's saying. Uh, so this symbol means this or means this sound. Well, Mayans will develop that, and so we actually have these stones, these Mayan books, where we can read about ancient Mayan rulers, different stories. They're the only group that's going to develop this writing system, though, and the Mayans are going to eventually collapse, or for the most part, they're going to collapse. We've recently figured out what Mayan writing says, how to read it, um, but we don't have that for other uh, American Indian civilizations. But again, you don't think of American... Again, when you think of American Indians, or most Americans do, uh, you're thinking of this teepee. You're not thinking of books, writing, uh, histories, but but that's absolutely the case here in Mesoamerica. Uh, other groups in Mesoamerica, this is a pyramid. You can see the people on it. Um, we'll talk about, uh, in 1492, these Aztecs. Uh, they're going to be the largest Mesoamerican civilization. We'll talk about them a little bit later, but, but just know that this is going to be where Agriculture is developed, and this is where the most complex civilizations are going to emerge. Now, some of this technology is going to pass out of these regions, and we will see agriculture spread out of these regions. And it's, and you're going to see this pretty soon after agriculture starts to be developed. Maybe it's not the most you know complex agriculture that you'll see in sort of the the center of these regions, but eventually agriculture is going to make its way out of there. So when Europeans arrive, we're going to have agriculture pretty much spread out throughout South America. Again, as we'll talk about some pockets down here, never get agriculture. And we're going to have agriculture start spreading north into what's today the United States. I know a lot of people, all right, sure, you know, we got these Indian civilizations everywhere, but what about America? Well, we're getting there. So agriculture by 8000 BC, it's it's taken hold in Mesoamerica. It's going to start spreading up north to North America, but it's going to take a long ass time. It really is. So agriculture's here. These huge cities start to emerge, but it's not going to make its way up to the what's today the United States until maybe 2000 BC. It's really going to take about, again, some of my numbers, anthropologists might yell at me, but take about 6000 BC for it to make its way north. Why is that the case? Why would it take so long for agriculture? Why isn't everybody here going to say, I'm a hunter-gatherer, boy, this, this corn looks good, I'm going to stop hunting and gathering, and I'm going to start growing corn. Well, part of the reason it's going to take agriculture so long to spread out of Mesoamerica to North America is that this area of northern Mexico is not good for growing crops. It's just not. It's it's dry. There's not very much rainfall. Um, if you try growing crops, even today, you try growing crops in a lot of areas of northern Mexico, it just simply doesn't grow well. There's not the rainfall. There's not the soil for it. So when agriculture starts making its way up, from Mesoamerica, people get it and they'll say, screw this, I'm going to keep hunting deer. I'm going to keep, you know, picking wild, uh, uh, whatever, cactus fruit. I'm going to start doing this uh, instead of growing this agriculture because it's too difficult. So it's going to take 6,000 years for sort of agriculture to creep its way along this little mountainous green corridor to make its way to North America. So maybe somebody here develops it but then it takes another 100 years for their northern neighbor to pick it up, another 500 years for their northern neighbor to pick it up, until eventually you get to this area. This Probably the first area in, in what's today the United States will adopt agriculture is probably uh, uh, this area of West Texas. It could be maybe uh, uh, this area here of New Mexico, but somewhere around this region we're going to have agriculture spread its way up. And when it gets to this area... We're going to see a unique culture emerge. And this agriculture, once it gets here, about 2000 BC, 
it's not going to immediately take hold. It's not like everybody's going to throw down their, their spears and their bows and arrows and say, we're now agriculturalists. It's going to take a while to spread around here. But once we start agricult seeing agriculture being adopted in this area, you will see a unique type of culture emerge. In this culture, we're going to call this the Pueblo culture that's going to emerge when agriculture starts being taken hold or taking hold in, in the American Southwest. Now, the thing when I'm about to describe this Pueblo culture, I don't want you to think about this as we would think about a nation or an empire or state. And as a matter of fact, you're going to have different empires emerge in Mesoamerica and the Andes. You know, one group will take over thousands, millions of people. Uh, you'll have a single king ruling over a lot of people. That's what you're going to see in, in uh, the old world. You're not going to see that here. They're not never going to get to that technological level or that um, sort of a level where they have the armies and the, the government to do that. So instead, when I talk about Pueblo culture, I basically mean similar language, similar housing uh, types of housing, similar types of food. It's just people that s live similarly, but they're not they wouldn't identify themselves as Pueblo. So you might have one town here that's very similar to this town right here, but uh, they might consider themselves enemies or they might consider themselves trading partners. Occasionally, maybe you'll get one town ruling over another town or a couple other towns, but it's never going to get to the point where you have a single king as Pueblo people. So don't think of it that way. The Pueblo people we're going to be talking about they never define themselves as a single person. It's just a convenient label we're putting on them these days, okay? So who were the Pueblo people and uh, uh, um, what was their deal? Like, how, what defines them? Well, the thing that's going to define the Pueblo people is that they're going to basically develop this civilization that is adopts agriculture in an area that is not suitable for agriculture. The American Southwest is incredibly dry. The soil isn't very fertile, but they're going to get this agriculture. And what you'll see over hundreds, thousands of years is they're almost going to come up with ways to transform their environment to make agriculture work. All right. And, and again, I should point out, not everybody here, their neighbors, a lot of their neighbors aren't going to adopt agriculture. It's just as sort of people and a lot of the people live right along this Rio Grande River are going to start uh, becoming agricultural and it's going to be uh, uh, it's going to take a, a, a very long time. So what makes the Pueblo culture the Pueblo culture is basically this idea of turning a uh, inhospitable environment into something that's ho hospitable. So if you went to a Pueblo culture village it might look something like this, okay, or something like this, okay. Um, basically, the Pueblo culture, they're getting all the stuff from Mesoamerica. They don't develop agriculture on their own. It's passed through northern Mexico, and the main crops are going to be passed uh, from Mexico is corn, beans, and squash. You'll sometimes see this referred to as the three sisters. Um, the, the, these are going to be sort of the staple of uh, the Pueblo culture people's diet. Uh, they sort of fit very well together because you have this corn uh, on, that grows on these long stalks. This provides carbohydrates. Uh, it's also going to provide a place for uh, uh, bean vines and, and these squash vines to grow and get sun. Um, the beans are going to provide protein to people. You know, the, the squash and the corn provide carbohydrates. Beans are also going to uh, take the nitrogen out of the air, put it in the soil, which is going to be helpful towards the, the squash and the corn. So these things grow well together, and they provide most of your nutritional needs. So uh, this is going to be what these uh, uh, the center is for this Pueblo culture diet. So you've got these crops, and they grow kind of well in, in this soil. You know, as we're going to talk about, they're going to grow better other places. They grow better down here in uh, Meso Mesoamerica. Um, but we'll actually see once it starts arriving some selective breeding of, of more dry weather versions of these crops. So this is one thing about this Pueblo culture. Another thing is going to be their architecture. So once you start seeing people become sedentary agriculturalists, they're going to start building these uh, fields, um, and start growing these foods. Again, this doesn't take place overnight. It's multiple generations. But once you start having people being fully sedentary agriculturalists, they'll start building these Pueblo homes. Pueblo uh, or uh, adobe homes would be a better word for it. 
Adobe is mud brick. You take, there's not a lot of wood in the Southwest. So if you want to create a building that's going to keep you safe from the elements, you're going to use what you have. What they have is a lot of mud. So you drive this stuff, you build this, uh, these homes made out of mud. And you can see this in sort of this, this is an example of a larger Pueblo culture town because eventually you're going to get to the point where Pueblo culture towns, first a couple hundred people, then a couple thousand. We'll eventually see a couple uh, that are more than 10,000 people. And what you'll have is these adobe buildings. Adobe is a really good brick for the southwest because it basically holds the uh, heat in at night. Nights can get really cold there, but it's very uh, also breathable during the day. So it'll get the cool in air in during the day. You actually see some of the designs of these towns to where uh, they orient it to where the sun is going to hit it perfectly. Uh, you know, to keep it cool during the day, warm at night. Uh, so this is going to be an aspect of the Pueblo culture. Another thing you see in this Pueblo culture city, some of these uh, houses are for living. There are other uh, that are w what you would call maybe pit house or storage pits where you would see people put corn in there, dried corn. So when you start growing corn, uh, you don't, you're going to get hit by drought a lot in the American Southwest. There are years where it, there's almost no rain, certainly not, not enough to support corn. So in years where you have surplus, you take the extra grain, you shove it in a hole, you cover it up, and then that's going to be there the next year in case the corn crop doesn't grow so the town doesn't completely die off. This is going to be something. Again, you can think of that as adaptability to the environment of the Southwest. Another thing you sort of see here in this Pueblo culture town is this huge road. So Pueblo culture people, again, independent town. Each town's going to have its own chief, its own government. Uh, you're going to have the laborers, their own shamans, that type of thing. But because there's, uh, you know, the Southwest doesn't have as much, you're going to see extensive trade. So there'll be roads between various uh, uh, Pueblo culture towns. So maybe there's a town five miles down the road. They've got a lot of flint, but they don't, you know, are running short on corn this year. You trade your corn for their flint, and you're going to have these huge roads. Some of these roads can fit, uh, you know, 12 people walking abreast, uh, and you'll have a lot of trade from one place to another. Um, one thing that this picture doesn't show, the, the Pueblo people will usually leave a lot of areas between towns without buildings because, again, you don't have the protein uh, sources because you don't have the domesticated animals. So you'll maybe have some guys to go out and hunt, uh, although that's not really depicted here. Um, you'll see pottery uh, in these towns, a lot of pottery for storing crops for years when there's droughts. Um, here's another depiction. Again, you'll see multi-story homes a lot of days. So if you're somebody who's born into a Pueblo culture town, you would, um, unless you're the elites, you're sort of bossing everybody around. But if you're average Joe Schmo, you and your families would go out. Well, we won't talk about how the land works. It's sort of this communal system, but you go out there, you pick corn all day. Then you go home and you sleep. Maybe there's a religious festival. Again, you got to keep people uh, working. So maybe you'll have uh, the shaman tell you, all right, you guys keep working uh, or I'll call the rain. I know we've had drought lately. And uh, you'll have that. Most of these Pueblo culture towns are going to be by a river. Again, Rio Grande for most of them. Uh, and this is to irrigate the crops. Again, if you're having drought, you want to have a water source nearby. Um, you'll see aqueducts. Um, a lot of these towns... You want to get water from the river uh, in times of drought, build these little aqueducts. You know, again, this isn't something we think about with American Indians, especially not in the United States, but you would have complex masonry like that. Again, one more time, these aren't, uh, here's here'd be an example of a, the interior of a town. Um, Pueblo culture people, sometimes they would trade with, um, there are still going to be hunter-gatherers in North America, they trade with them, or buffalo hide. A lot of times they wear cotton clothing. They would pick cotton cloth or pick the cotton fiber, weave that together to create clothing. So maybe this is the type of house you're going to live in. Um, you know, again, uh, maybe live something like this. Uh, another picture of uh, what it would look like in a Pueblo culture town. Here, so if you go to the American Southwest today, you're not going to see this. This fall, fell apart because it's made of adobe. Uh, as a matter of fact, this picture right here, modern picture is going to wouldn't look anything like this. It's, it's basically uh, falling apart a lot f uh, from this. And e this uh, picture taken sometime around 1915, something like that. This is uh, closer to what it looked like 
1492 when Europeans arrived, but uh, you know, when this place was at its height, you would have had this multi-story, again, sort of a castle-like thing uh, where all these people lived. Um, again, this is 1915, so by this point, it's, it's all fallen down. Uh, but you still, if actually, if you go to the southwest today, you will still see a lot of um, uh, Pueblo culture people still around. You, you, you know, you have a lot of um, Pueblo culture people. If you, you ever hear the term Hopi, Zuni, Akoma, Anasazi, uh, those are all Pueblo culture people. We sort of lump them into the uh, Pueblo culture banner. And you can go out to the southwest and uh, um, you'll see a lot of the, those Pueblo culture style houses. So we have this huge agricultural area. And actually by 1492, I've seen tons of different estimates, but some people say about half a million people living in these various Pueblo culture towns. Some towns, 10,000 people you know, most, you know, that we would classify over a thousand, five thousand, something like that. So we have these huge cities out here. So that's the Pueblo culture. Now the deal with the Pueblo culture, again, it spreads north from Mexico and it's going to develop and by, let's go with 500 uh, AD or so, this, this agriculture, actually even before that, 500 BC or so, agriculture is pretty much spread out of this area and and we have these these people developed so we have 2000 BC arrives out here there are a lot of debate about this but we don't think agriculture is gonna really make its way over until 700 AD over here to the eastern part of North America why is that the case why does it get here from uh, in 2000 BC but it's gonna take another 3000 years to get over here well, this is the same reason it took so long for agriculture to pass in northern Mexico. This area of northern Mexico, all the way up to what's today Canada, this really large swath right here, it's just terrible for growing crops, okay? Today we think about this as the breadbasket of the United States. You know, this is Kansas, Nebraska. This is where we grow our crops. The only reason we grow our crops out there today is because we have technology for irrigation, and we've discovered hundreds of miles under the ground, there's a huge aquifer, a huge basically underwater ocean. That is where we get our water for our crops from. Normally this area is incredibly dry, uh, even drier than, than this area out here. Uh, the ground's not very fertile. So for hundreds and thousands of years, agriculture is not going to spread across this region because it's not a very good region for growing agriculture. So we'll have people here, there'll be hunter-gatherers out here, and, oh man, those guys look like they're growing crops. It looks like their population is growing. Let's try it. Shoot, doesn't work out here. Well, forget it. Let's go back to hunting and gathering. Eventually, however, don't know exactly how this happens. Eventually, agriculture is going to make its way over 700 AD. Again, I see so many different numbers for this, but 700 AD, it'll eventually reach this area that's probably about t today's East Texas. Once it gets there, and once you start seeing people growing, corn, beans, and squash, it's going to spread like wildfire. Agriculture is going to go from everybody over here being hunter-gatherers uh, in uh, 700 AD to uh, everybody, or at least a good chunk of the population, being sedentary agriculturalists very quickly. Now, why is that the case? It took thousands of years for agriculture to spread around this small area. Why is it just going to take a couple hundred years for it to spread all over this area. It's because this area is really good for growing crops. It's a lot wetter than um, this area. There's a, a lot more rivers. The rivers are deeper. The soil's better. So what happens when agriculture gets over here, the pl people that start growing it, they're going to get so many calories. You know, hey, look at our neighbor, Bill. He's starting to grow this weird corn. He, what is he doing sticking seeds in the ground? Wow, Bill has 10 kids that survive into adulthood. Um, wow, those kids are, you know, uh, growing big. Maybe we should give this a shot. Again, probably happened a different way than that, but you can kind of see that those who start growing this are going to start thriving because it's so easy to grow food here. So this is going to spread rapidly, and it's especially going to grow in this area right around the Mississippi River in this really fertile region from, you know, uh, what's today about South Carolina all the way to uh, what's today East Texas, this really fertile area near the Mississippi Delta all the way up until Illinois. And we're going to see a merge in this region 
a, a different type of people that we're going to call the Mississippi culture, okay? So again, the thing you need to remember, this Mississippi culture, this isn't a kingdom. It's not like, uh, you know, as we're going to talk about uh, later, like the Mayans had a single king. That was an empire. One person ruled over dozens, hundreds of towns, millions of people. Uh, we're going to see that in, in the Andes. We don't see that with the playable culture. We're not going to see that with the Mississippi culture. There's not going to be a single Mississippi culture king. This is just a name we as historians are going to slap on these people of this Mississippi area, this area this, today, the United States Southeast. That uh, it's Again, people that have similar language, sim similar monumental architecture, similar pottery. So what you see when agriculture gets over here is the population in this Mississippi culture area is going to grow so rapidly in, and you're going to see it's so easy to support agriculture, a lot of surplus labor. What makes this area complicated or so complex is because the people had to adapt to be able to uh, uh, grow agriculture. Here, what's going to make this uh, er, these Indians so domestic or so technologically um, advanced is the fact that they have so much surplus calories, they have so much surplus labor, and we're going to have this culture emerge of I don't want to say excess, but of just rapid development. Okay, so what do we need to know about this Mississippi culture? Well, Mississippi culture people going to live in very different style homes than the Pueblo culture people. Pueblo culture people live in adobe because that's what is available. Well, the U.S. South or area that is going to become the U.S. Southeast, a lot of different um, wood. So you're going to have wood homes as opposed to adobe homes, um, sort of these straw leaf different huts. Um, you see, you see uh, in these cities, walls. This is actually, you can tell this is not going to be a single unified empire because you don't build walls if you all worship the same guy or listen to the same king. So one Mississippi culture town is going to have its own ruler. The guys next door, maybe they're your allies, maybe you trade with them. Occasionally you'll see one ruler over a couple towns, but there's a good chance they're also going to be your enemies, so you don't want them attacking you, so you better put up some guard towers and some walls. Another thing that's going to make this Mississippi culture uh, pretty unique is this uh, uh, trade network. So you've got a lot of rivers. That means you can trade between towns a lot easier. So maybe a town up here has some cool items. Uh, they send the canoes down here. They're going to trade with this area down there. So you're going to see trade from a thousand miles away. We get seashells come from the coast up here. It's actually kind of interesting. We think hunter-gatherers uh, bring Pueblo culture items uh, between uh, to the Mississippi culture. You'll see some exchange to these intermediaries between the two groups. But trade is a big deal, and you can kind of see that here with this marketplace uh, that, that's sort of uh, in, in this area here. This is probably, I don't know if this would be an accurate description, but uh, vendors. Maybe this, this guy's from a town 100 miles down the river. This guy's from 100 miles uh, to the east, something like that. So you're going to have things uh, like that in these Mississippi culture towns. Trade, uh, extensive uh, defenses set up. Uh, pottery, you see this extensive pottery. Uh, tobacco is going to be big in Mississippi culture. So you'll see a lot of these snuff plates where essentially they grind up tobacco uh, to either smoke or uh, I guess snuff, either snort or uh, ingest some way. Um, Mississippi culture towns this is a, an example of one of the bigger Mississippi culture towns. Um, if you are just average Joe Schmo, you'll probably live in one of these small houses, just a wooden house, which would probably be comparable to somebody in Europe, Africa, or Asia. You're probably going to go out every day, uh, work the fields, corn, beans, squash, make your way over back home, you know, go home, live with your family at night. Um, you'll see right here, there are all these canoes. This is kind of indicative of, you know, you trade with a different city o over there. Maybe that's your job. Um, over right here, it's kind of interesting. Like other American Indians, you don't, because the first generations killed off the megafauna, you don't, you're not going to have a lot of domesticated animals. You'll have a handful of dogs, handful of turkey. This isn't going to provide the protein needs for uh, large cities like this. Like this is a Cahokia, um, it reached over 30,000 people at its peak. Um, in order to get protein, they basically leave areas near the, the uh, city uh, to be hunting grounds. So maybe you, that's your job. Maybe you're the guy that goes out 
gets the deer, brings that back in. Uh, maybe uh, your brother's uh, a farmer goes out here, farms, come here and brings the food. So that would be average Joe Schmo. Uh, this right here, this right here, maybe these are, um, this one is a, a sports place. You know, again, you have surplus uh, labor, you can play sports. If you're an elite, again, these classes form these agriculture. Uh, if you're an elite, you'll probably live at the top of this pyramid. Um, you want the people to listen to you. You're going to go out, you or the shaman, maybe the leader and the shaman are one and the same. So you're going to go out here, you'll have like these uh, religious meetings, and you'll um, uh, tell the people, keep doing your job, keep growing your food, uh, keep making the gods happy. And it's actually interesting because you see these mounds, this is going to be the defining feature of Mississippi culture towns is these mounds. This might not seem like much. This is an example. It's a modern-day view of this mound, a little bit uh, kind of close to St. Louis. Um, this is called Monk's Mound. doesn't seem that impressive, but it really is. So if you measure the volume of Monk's Mound, it's, it's actually this, more material than you would have in the pyramid, uh, Great Pyramid of Giza. Again, you know, it's not the huge stones. It's not as... Uh, as a complex engineering, but it's going to require a ton of work. I, I'm going to try and get the exact number here. So it would supposedly take 40 million people carrying a 50 pound sack of dirt to build this mound. All right. So that's impressive, but it's the thing that makes it even more impressive is it's not like they're picking the dirt from over here and just bringing it and sticking it over here in order to build these mounds. You would sometimes send people 200 miles away fill up a sack, and then bring this dirt 200 miles away. And the reason that they have to get dirt from other areas is that the way the elites wanted this, again, this isn't something hunter-gatherer groups could do. This is only very agric uh, technologically advanced Indians that can do this. Uh, but the way that they would do this is they would um, send people 200 miles away uh, to get different colored dirt. So if you're looking at this mound and, you know, when when the city's at its height, you would have a base layer. Maybe this layer is built by one generation of, of people in the town. Maybe this is black dirt. We all know dirt can be different colors. Maybe this is sort of a yellowish dirt. His children builds it. Maybe the next one does it red dirt, brown dirt, something like that. And so this is usually built over multiple generations. And what these mounds are built for is uh, to show leaders power, you know, like, hey, look what we built. It's built as sort of a burial structure for these leaders. So if you go dig into these mounds, a lot of times you'll find uh, bones of leaders. A lot of times they'll bury themselves with, you know, maybe uh, uh, farming implements or maybe uh, hunting implements or maybe things from fighting their neighbors, maybe clubs that they've they've built, uh, pretty pottery, some of the advanced, you know, stuff, snuff plates, stuff like that. Uh, so you, you can actually we go out today, find these mounds everywhere. Um, uh, again, they've been overgrown by this time, the vast majority. In Texas, you go to Far East Texas, we have Cattle Mound State Park, where you'll see a lot of these things that haven't been uh, uh, grown over, that have been kept up by historians and archaeologists. But uh, people have dug into these things. As I grew up in North Carolina, uh, in Georgia, and then Texas. And in North Carolina, we would see these little... Indian burial mounds and like my parents would always tell us don't go digging them up and I mean you just drive along the side of the road and you can get them all the way up into Illinois uh, they're not going to be as big as this one this is the biggest one but you will see these small mounds that's where um, you know it used to be an Indian town uh, where where people built these things and one thing I should say Mississippi culture Pueblo culture you have this advanced stuff not as advanced as Mesoamerica or the Andes Again, it's not going to get to that point, but but this is some impressive stuff. So Mississippi culture, think about them as uh, uh, as, as having these mound structures. And uh, the heart of Mississippi culture, where you sort of see the biggest structures, are going to be sort of this center area where it's the most fertile. Um, here in East Texas, we're sort of the edge of Mississippi culture, we see smaller mounds. And then again, where I grew up in North Carolina, sort of the edge here, uh, it, it would be the smaller mounds, but uh, this area around here, pretty advanced stuff and um, cotton clothing you'll see in this region. Um, today, we don't, again, we have individual groups uh, of, of within the Mississippi culture. Mississippi culture is a label we put on similar people. People could be at war with each other, but if um, 
you know, you know somebody or you are part of the Cherokee Creek, Chickasaw, Choctaw, that's a Mississippi culture groups. These are sort of the descendants of this Mississippi culture. Um, as a matter of fact, when uh, English and Americans come over, they're going to start calling these guys the civilized tribes. You know, these are the guys that are advanced, okay? All right. So we have these two incredibly technologically advanced groups in what's today going to be the United States. Pueblo culture, maybe 500,000. Mississippi culture, maybe 2 million. Uh, I've actually heard upwards of 3 million in this area. Towns of, you know, hundreds, thousands, 5,000, 10,000. Uh, in one instance, 30,000. Same thing over here. Very dense, very technologically advanced. Again, not going to be as advanced as Mesoamericans or the Andes, not as advanced as we're going to talk about as a lot of Europeans, Africans, and Asians, but way more advanced than the uh, the people are used to. Again, you're living in sedentary, you're, you're growing up in one place, you're going to be in this place your entire life, um, you're not moving around to teepees or anything like that. So this is going to be part of the people up here, and I would actually say this would be maybe a third of the people, and I'm just estimating, I could you probably get different estimates from one place to another, maybe a third of the people in the area that's today the United States or the area north of Mexico before Europeans arrived. So estimates I've seen is 10 million people in North America in, in 1492, maybe 3 million uh, between the Pueblo culture and Mississippi culture. So does that mean the other 7 million are those hunter-gatherers? Nope, absolutely not. A good chunk of the others are going to be these groups that are sedentary agriculturalists, but they're just not as advanced as the uh, Mississippi culture, Pueblo culture, or these groups down here. It's going to be people that have gotten agriculture, but maybe they've only gotten it recently. Maybe it's only arrived up here, uh, you know, in the past couple hundred years before Europeans show up. Or maybe it's areas like uh, Florida or up here, um, uh, you know, when when you start to get to this area that's maybe not as good for growing crops. And they just simply can't have the population as you're going to see in the Mississippi culture just because it's not as good to grow crops. So what you're going to have, and this is going to extend here to Florida, and this is in all the agricultural areas. As a matter of fact, you know, uh, you'll see some agriculture spread along some of these rivers. Um, but what you'll have in this general area, a little bit up into Canada here as well, is groups that are sedentary agriculturalists. People are going to spend their lives uh, in one location. Maybe um, maybe they move, you know, uh, a little bit because of a, a hurricane or something, or they get in the war with a neighbor or something. But for the most part, they live in one place. They stay in that one place their entire lives. They grow food. And they're actually going to live very similar to average Joe Schmo in Europe, Africa, and Asia. So what you're going to have is these groups like the Mandans, Powhatans, we'll talk about those later, the Tainos, this group that extends in the Caribbean and in southern Florida, uh, the Wampanoags, we'll talk about them later, the Iroquois. Uh, we won't talk about the Chinook very much, but uh, we're going to have these various groups that have gotten agriculture by 1492. They've had it for hundreds of years and they live in one place. So this would be the Powhatans. We'll talk about them later. Uh, they're not going to live in cities uh, in the tens of thousands like in the Mississippi culture or the Pueblo culture. And you actually, you're going to see a couple Powhatan cities, uh, more than a, a thousand people. But you are going to have cities and thousands of people. You're going to have these fields of crops. This is a, a European drawing of, a, of a, the Powhatans. And, you know, you'll grow crops, you'll uh, go out in the fields, you'll live in a, a, a wooden home uh, with your family, maybe your extended family. You go out there and then, uh, you know, at night you'll go uh, religious ceremony or play sports, something like that. Um, you'll have different styles of crops. Again, this be eastern part of North America, corn, beans, and squash. Uh, they also grew stuff like sunflowers. Um, maybe you'll have a chief over... Your, your particular uh, town. Occasionally you'll get a couple towns aligned with one another, a couple towns under a single chief. No empires, again, uh, in North America, uh, at least not compared to what we see in Mesoamerica, the Andes. Um, and also in these towns, you're going to have roads between uh, one um, Indian group and another. Sometimes you'll see these things surrounded by walls if you're uh, enemies with uh, the neighbors. 
um, you'll see right here, this is uh, interesting because uh, you, you have this wooded area and you got these guys hunting. Again, the domesticated, uh, the lack of domesticated animals means Indians are always going to have to have their hunting grounds. You don't see that with Europeans because, as we're going to talk about, they're going to have domesticated animals, so they don't need to go out and hunt deer. They just have uh, their cows uh, or pigs or whatever that they can they can slaughter when they need meat. But for the most part, very similar to what you would see um, the non-elites living like in Europe. So this would be these sort of lighter colored areas here. And again, I don't have exact numbers, but maybe 4 million, something like that, uh, are in these uh, sedentary agricultural societies that are not as advanced as a Mississippi culture or Pueblo culture. So these are the more advanced areas, again, not as advanced as Mesoamerica and the Andes. Uh, these are sedentary agriculturalist, uh, not as advanced as the darker purple, so that's going to be the majority of the population of North America when Europeans show up. But that's not who we think of. And, and, and again, the, I should point out that we think of these hunter-gatherers. So why is that going to be the case? And I, why is it going to be the case when these guys, again, maybe 20% are these hunter-gatherers are going to be spread out here in Canada along these areas where food doesn't grow as well uh, in these region here? Why do we think about these hunter-gatherers uh, that that are either living in areas where it's too cold for agriculture or areas like this where agriculture doesn't grow well? Um, these hunter-gatherers, you know, they'll move from one place to another. They're very similar to how um, you know people would have lived. 10,000 years uh, ago before the development of agriculture in Mesoamerica and the Andes. Um, why do we think of these guys that chase game herds, that move from one place to another, why do we think of them when they're a minority of the population of, um, uh, of, of, uh, of North America? Um, and by the way, I should point out, this group in particular here, these hunter-gatherers, uh, the way the Spanish are going to come to refer to these hunter-gatherers, the, the non-sedentary agriculturalists, is they're going to call them chichimecas. That's basically the people that move all the time, uh, and they're just going to refer to anybody that, that's uh, not sedentary as these chichimecas. Uh, we today refer to them as groups like the Apaches uh, and things like that. Why the Sioux, uh, other groups like that. Why do we think of the Apaches and the Sioux when that wasn't what most American Indians were. What brings these guys to mind? Why would we, why wouldn't we think of, when we think of American Indians, think of Mesoamerican Indians, think of huge cities like this? Why wouldn't we think of cities in the Andes with castles? Why wouldn't we think of uh, cities in, um, uh, you know, Pueblo culture cities, 5,000, 10,000 people, Mississippi culture cities, why do we think of these guys when there were more of these guys? Why would we think of that? There's a lot of different reasons. Um, well, some of the reasons some people will point to is maybe it makes the narrative easier. Uh, maybe, you know, as we're going to talk about, spoiler alert, Europeans are going to come over. They're going to become dominant on uh, in the Americas, the dominant power. Maybe over time it's sort of become easier to just think of we're just pushing aside a Stone Age civilization. It doesn't make it easy to digest if you're talking about one group pushing out a group that maybe not as technologically advanced, but it's pretty darn close like this. Maybe maybe that's it. I think that's part of it. Maybe it's just the fact that these guys are going to be around and survive into the 1800s, and these guys are not going to survive very long, at least not as they existed in 1492. So what we're going to see happen when Europeans come up, is base, or come to the Americas, is we're going to see them head straight for these places. So when Europeans arrive, they're not going to go to where these guys live. So hunter-gatherers live in areas where there's not anything. There's very few people. 
Again, the people are scattered and dozens of people constantly searching for food. The land's not very fertile. But these people here, here, Mesoamerican, the Andes, they've got fertile land. They already have pre-existing political structures that are easy to take over, and they have stuff. Europeans, when they come, are going to head to the areas with stuff. Places like this area, Tenochtitlan, Lawn, and the heart of Mesoamerica, they have, people here have gold. They have uh, uh, complex textiles. They have uh, jewels, things Europeans are going to value. So they're going to go there, and they're actually going to find these guides, even though it doesn't make a lot of sense, because how would it be easier to conquer a city of 200,000 than it would be a couple groups of a couple dozen? It, it would seem like these guys would be easier to take over, but that's not actually going to be the case. All you have to do, and we're going to talk about this next time, to do is take to take this over is go in kill the leader stick yourself on top of it and then you've basically already got these pre-existing political uh sort of knots that are going to be allow you to control everybody below you and once you do that you can sort of remake these cities in the european image if you want to take out these guys you've got to take this group here then you got to take that group there you got to take this group over here and it's going to be a lot more difficult so when Europeans come, they're going to head straight to the areas where there are stuff, and they're going to use their technological advantages to take over these large civilizations. And when they take them over, they're going to start transforming them. So if you go to this area today, it's Mexico City. We're going to talk about how that happens uh, later. But this is Mexico City. Uh, it's been remade into European-style uh, uh, city um, because that's where Europeans headed. They don't head here until the 1800s because there's no reason to head to the plains of the Americas because you can't grow anything. It's only when you get technology that's going to allow you to grow that you're going to go here, head here anyway. And then when you do confront these people, you basically got to eliminate all of them to take them out. You don't have to eliminate all these guys uh, because you, um, uh, all you got to do is take out their leaders. So that's part of the reason is that this is where Europeans head. Another reason is this is going to these areas the the more densely populated regions they're going to be the ones that are going to be hit hardest with smallpox. So Europeans are going to come over with these diseases that American Indians had never been exposed to. Again, some people think it's because of domesticated animals. You don't have enough as much uh, animals living besides humans as you do in Europe, Asia, and Africa. And when that happens, uh, th that's going to mean that. Uh, less disease pass from one person to another. Uh, when, th when that happens, um, that's going to mean that uh, less disease sharing and uh, less immunities pass down the generations. So when Europeans come, they're going to head straight to the big cities. These cities are going to be overwhelmed by disease because they're going to pass really quickly if you have people uh, tightly uh, packed for one another. These guys out here on the plains, they're just a couple dozen people in each village you know, they're not going to infect one another. If one get, village gets infected, probably not going to infect the next village because it's, it's uh, or I shouldn't even say village, that, that implies they're sedentary. Probably not going to uh, infect the next camp because they're dozens of miles away. So what this all means is that uh, these areas are going to be hit the worst by disease, and they're also going to be the areas where Europeans are going to head. It's a horrible example, but you might want to think what's about to happen as... Independence Day. If anybody's ever seen Independence Day, you know, these aliens come down, and where they head is the big cities. Washington, D.C., New York, Los Angeles, they blow those up first. And then, you know, whatever, there's just the people outside the cities left. That's what Europeans do. They head to the big cities in the Americas. But then I want you to think about Independence Day followed by The Walking Dead, because that's basically what happens is the big cities get hit by these technologically advanced civilizations, then disease is going to come in. And so it's going to completely wipe out some of these cities. I shouldn't say completely wipe out, but it's going to wipe out a huge portion of the civilization. Then these conquerors show up, and what the conquerors are going to do is transform everything into Europeans. And the only groups that are going to be left are these hunter-gatherers. And so I think that's uh, a part of the reason that we, uh, we think of American Indians uh, that way. But what we're going to talk about next time is how the Europeans show up, and what they're going to do with, uh, to the American Indians when they get there.